The engine war had begun with the ambitions of Toyotomi Hideyoshi. See, his plan had been to conquer the Ming Dynasty, first by having the Joseon to join him and his armies, and then together march on Beijing. However, the Joseon refused to betray the Ming, which prompted Hideyoshi to launch his invasions of Korea in 1592 with devastating effect. The Japanese would continue to wreak havoc in Korea. In fact, the Korean king almost abdicated his throne all the way in early 1593. And at this time, the Ming, who had been receiving requests for help from the Joseon, finally sent men. The success that the Japanese had would now work against them as they moved through Korea incredibly fast, but also outran their own supply lines. Now, in the middle of winter, both the Ming and Joseon had the chance to push the Japanese back, which they did. Knowing that they couldn't keep the capital, the Japanese would, after negotiating with the Ming, retreat south where they still had a firm hold on the country. They would then hold a truce and negotiate for two whole years. Talks would eventually break down though, and Toyotomi Hideyoshi would launch another invasion in 1597. This invasion was incredibly brutal, as Hideyoshi had now given up the idea of the Koreans eventually joining him, and instead opted for scorched earth tactics. Then, all of a sudden, the Japanese retreat south again, despite the fact that the Japanese were actually receiving a lot of success. So why? The answer is actually simple. Winter. But not just that. They didn't want to make the same mistakes that they had made in the first invasion. And a massive Ming army was on its way. So they fell back to their defensive line with the idea that they would cause more damage to the Ming by playing defense. A tactic that feels awfully similar to the German tactics in the First World War. This leads us to the Siege of Ulsan in the winter of 1597. By mid-December, the Ming army started to march south from Seoul, much to the relief of the Korean citizens who felt that the Ming soldiers were unruly and had taken far too long to begin their next offensive. Yang Hao would have overall command. Under him was the left army commander Li Rumei, central army commander Gao Zhe, and right army commander Li Fengchun, each with approximately 12,000 soldiers. Yang Hao, according to the annals of King Sanjo, invited the Korean king to ride with them for the first couple of kilometers. At first it was done at a moderate pace, but the second they left Seoul's south gate, Yang dug his heels into his horse and set the animal into a run, which forced King Sanjo to do the same. He, not being a skilled horseman, struggled to keep up. He did, though, and made it all the way to the Han River. It's difficult to say what this was all about. I do think it's safe to say that this was done on purpose, though. But I would like you to leave me your thoughts on this down below. The Ming commander-in-chief Ma Guoi left his camp and moved east till he met with Yang Hao's army on January 26 at Kyungju. He then combined his army with Yang's. If I'm not mistaken, this would actually be close to 40,000 men. They would then be joined by Korean Commander-in-Chief Kwon Yul's 10,000-man army. This incredibly large army then moved to the southeast towards Ulsan. There was a slight problem with the supply line that the Koreans were supposed to provide, as they started to disappear before the Allied army even reached Ulsan, as this will actually play into the battle ahead. January 26 saw the start of the combat. A Ming cavalry force of about 3,000 arrived ahead of the main army before the sun had risen. The plan was to destroy the garrison at Byongyong Song. However, the garrison foolishly didn't post any sentries and got completely destroyed. The Ming force then attacked a nearby camp. The commotion of the slaughter alerted a much larger Japanese force to race forward to try and save what was left of the garrison, 
The commander of the Ming force, Li Rumei, commanded his troops to fall back, where a much larger Ming force was waiting to ambush the Japanese. As the Japanese foot soldiers charged forward, they found themselves running into a Ming force laying themselves out in a crane formation. They charged still, though they were not able to overtake them. Instead, fierce fighting continued between the two armies until the sun had fully risen in the morning. The Ming commander-in-chief, Ma Guoi, then personally led a 200-strong Mongol cavalry force to charge the Japanese from the rear. Nearly three hours of fighting went on before the Japanese decided that they needed to retreat. They split into two groups, one to retreat and the other one to cover the retreat. The Japanese casualties was said to be around 500 at this time, while the Ming's, well, stay to the end of this series and we'll talk about that. The Ming army then burned down the Japanese camp. Commander Ma Goi and Li Rumei then decide to rest and wait for the allied Ming and Korean army. The Japanese made the decision to send a dispatch to Kato Kiyomasa who was shocked by the news and raced from Sosengpo to Ulsan by boat up the Taewo River and into Dosan Fortress at midnight. He did this without the enemy noticing him slip into the fortress. The Dosan Fortress he discovered was not in ideal shape. The construction had not been fully completed. One of the gates on the outer wall actually hadn't had its gate finished, which left a huge hole in the defense, something that could and would be exploited. January 30th, just a few hours after Kato Kiyomasa took charge of the situation on the Japanese side, the Ming started preparations for their next assault. The plan was to launch an attack in multiple locations at the same time, thus overwhelming the enemy, leading to victory. Li Fengchun's army would attack the river fortress at Taewa. Li Rumei would attack the fortress directly, and Gao Zhe's army would secure Jotan to repel any Japanese reinforcements that might arrive. Yang Hao and Ma Gui, being the highest ranked commanders, supervised Li Rumei and Li Fengchun's assaults personally. The Japanese caught on just after about an hour as their enemies started to move, and braced for the attack. Kato Kiyomasa started to give out orders to his men. Asano Yoshinaga was commanded to leave his camp and move into Ulsan Fortress. Kato Yoseyaman was also commanded to move in. Two hours after that, say around 6 or 7 a.m., the actual assault began with a barrage of artillery and rockets, which set many of the buildings and even some of the ships in the dock on fire. Li Rumei's forces then assaulted the fortress complex. Asano Yoshinaga's camp soon fell. However, Sanoa's men were able to put up a fierce resistance that lasted anywhere between three to four hours. And as oppressive as this resistance was, the Ming were able to break through the northwest corner of the fortress. Kato Kiyomasa understood that Ulsan Fortress was a lost cause and ordered Asano Yoshinaga and his men to fall back to Dosan Fortress. While they retreated, the Ming flooded in, killing all the defenders that had lagged behind. The fort of Bengu Zhong and Siobong Dong Song was also captured at this time. While this happened, the Tewa River Fortress was also being attacked by Li Feng Chun and his men, which honestly never stood a chance against the much more numerically superior Ming force. It of course fell. Li Feng Chun's men then started to make their way towards Ulsan Fortress complex. Funny enough, while all these battles were going on, Gao Zhe at Jontan sent a messenger to his superior Yang Hao for permission to join the battle. This annoyed Yang, who had the messenger's ear cut off. But, seeing the benefits and perhaps even the need, he eventually sent one of his own messengers to Gao Zhe to move his men almost three kilometers closer to Tosan. Around noon the same day, Dosan Fortress was the only thing left that was resisting the Ming Joseon allied army. Yang Hao and Ma Guai then moved forward and made a hill named Hak Sung San their new siege camp. 
so they could oversee the battle. Once that was done, all three armies, Gao Zhe, Li Rumei, and Li Fengchun, attacked all at once. Cannons and rockets were fired at the walls, killing laborers and soldiers alike. The Ming then utilized grappling hooks to try to tear down the walls. A Japanese source describes the determination from both sides. A large hook grabbed the top of the wall. 50 men, maybe even 100, pulled on the rope to bring the wall down. We shot at them from the side. When we did, only 10, maybe even just 5, remained to pull the wall down. They are brave men. Other sources say that the Ming were so determined in their assault that they were practically crawling onto their own dead to scale the walls. Now, despite the losses, the Ming were successful in tearing down several walls and had scaled several others. From the east side of Dosan, the Ming captured the gate of Obigarua. They then attacked the Ninomaru, but this was defended by Kato Kiyomasa himself, and through his skillful use of his matchlock men and a corps of samurai, they were able to resist two Ming commanders and their attacking force. Ming commander Li Rumei even joined the fray and assaulted the east gate of the Hanmaru with at least 200 troops. However, the troops he took with him had inner problems with the Ming troops that were supposed to support them, some being from the north and some being from the south. Commander-in-chief Ma Gui would actually step in and force him to call off the assault. Almost all of the initial 200 men died without the much-needed support. Around two hours from the initial assault, 40 Japanese ships of various sizes reached Ulsan from Soseng Po with a mission to provide reinforcements and badly needed supplies. The Ming commander in charge of the assault, Yang Hao, sent a thousand cavalry men and 2,000 Zhejing infantry to the river to stop the Japanese from reinforcing the besieged men at Dosan. The Ming forces actually didn't have a way to truly intercept them, though, as the Ming didn't have any warships in the area. There wasn't any Korean ships either. Luckily for the Ming commander assaulting the fortress from the west side, Chen Yin saw the ships and ordered his artillery to fire on them and actually managed to sink three of the ships. The Japanese ships then moved out of range of the cannons and waited till the end of the day to see if there would be an opening. Sometime around 4 to 5, the same day, with both Ming and Korean losses reaching an unacceptable rate, the Ming decided to call back their forces. The Japanese saw the Ming signal to retreat, which prompted Asano Yoshinaga to open the west gate of the Hanru, and his men flooded out, killing every soldier that they could get their hands on. Kato Kiyomasa then ordered Asano to chase down the Ming out of the fortress. The Ming then brought up cannons to bring down the walls. But they had no effect due to the fact that the citadel was built on much higher ground than what the Ming could currently bring their cannons on. This barrage is said to have lasted for the rest of the day. Sometime around 7, the tides in the Tewa River began to rise. The Japanese flotilla off in the war took advantage of this rising tide and rushed in to drop off reinforcements, supplies, and take in some of the injured. Yang Hao would actually think that Kato Kiyomasa had left on this ship, most likely thinking that he was cowardly and tried to chase them down, but didn't get anything for his efforts. When he returned, Yang Hao called all the commanders so that they could discuss what their next course of action would be. It was decided that they would simply just burn down the fortress, and the soldiers were ordered to collect firewood for the rest of the day in preparation of tomorrow. The Japanese were also busy. Kato Kiyomasa oversaw makeshift modifications and repairs that night personally, the biggest modification being more gun ports being put into the walls. Later that night, a raid into the Ming camps was to be held, but was called off when the Japanese scouts realized that the camps were actually just too well guarded. January 31st. Just like before, 
the Ming launched their attack just before the sun was up. The Ming would launch seven assaults that day. Kato Kiyomasa wore a green jinbaiori carrying a banner leading the matchlock men from the front. It's even said that he participated in the shooting to keep the Ming off the walls. The supplies put the Japanese in a very good spot. On the other side of the field, the Ming, though, were already starting to suffer. See, they had been forced to camp out in the surrounding woods. And on top of that, they were forced to sustain themselves on field rations. Every time the Ming and Joseon approached the walls, they were met with heavy casualties. Joseon official Ru Songyong would actually write about this in his book, saying, The guards of the enemy stayed inside that corridor and from there discharged their matchlocks. Whenever their opponents approached, pouring down bullets. Every day this kind of battle was repeated, and the bodies of Chinese soldiers and our own began to pile up under the walls of those fortress. Several of the Ming captains, including Zhou San, and even righteous army commander leaders had died in these assaults. Around 7 p.m., Yang Hao came to the realization that these assaults were a failure and called them off. While the attack on the fortress had been going on, another Japanese flotilla showed up. On board the ships, Japanese matchlock men opened up on the Ming on the beach. Li Rumei then had his cannons fire on some of the Japanese ships and managed to even sink a few. Then Yang Hao ordered the commanders Gao Sei and Zhu Cheng Zun to reinforce the men on the beach. Seeing as the ships didn't have a way around the Ming cannons, the Japanese flotilla withdrew. Later, after the attacks had been called off, Yang Hao sent a messenger to Kato Kiyomasa to negotiate a potential surrender. Kato sent a message back saying that he would only be open to it if the Koreans also agreed to the terms to be made. Yang Hao withdrew the offer then. On the first day of February, Korean supplies were finally delivered from Kyongju. Now, with supplies in hand, Yang Hao decided to let his men take the day off and rest. However, he ordered the Korean commander-in-chief Guan Yul to continue the attack and also to fill in any water wells near Dosan Fortress. Guan Yul agreed to this and gave orders to attack. The Korean soldiers approached cautiously, holding their wooden shields high. The plan was to stack up the firewood gathered days before at the base of the fortress and then set it on fire. The Japanese defenders, though, once again let loose a wall of bullets, which caused the Korean attackers to suffer severe losses. This caused the army to begin to panic. Guan Yul then executed several Joseon officials to restore order in the army. Yul then led the army personally. Once again, the concentrated fire of the Japanese guns cut through the army, and the Koreans were forced to retreat. Now, while this attack was happening, a Japanese relief force arrived from Soseng Po on the outskirts of Ulsan and met with another Japanese flotilla coming in from Yonpo. They would combine their forces together and then try to give the defenders at Tosan more supplies through the waterways. Li Rumei would catch on though and ordered his men to fire any available cannons and rockets at the ships in the water. There was a back and forth for quite a while when one of the Japanese ships started to take on water. They then decided to retreat. Yang Hao, meanwhile, sent his messenger once again to try and get the Japanese to surrender. This time though, the messenger shouted at a distance so that the entire garrison could hear him and promise them rewards. One soldier actually did leave. Yang Hao was incredibly happy by this and gave the man a horse and paraded him outside the walls in sight of all the Japanese defenders. Kato Kiyomasa in response blocked off the exits just in case and I wouldn't be surprised if he actually had men executed. The weather turned suddenly. Heavy rain and wind battered the Ming soldiers in the camp causing many of them to become sick. February 2nd. It was continuing to downpour, turning many of the fields into deep swamps. 
Around 8 a.m., another Japanese flotilla arrived from Yonpo once again to reinforce the defenders. Yang Hao and Ma Gui, in response, took control of the armies and commanded the Joseon army to surround the fortress to prevent the Japanese from breaking through. While this happened, about a third of the Ming army went to the riverbank to try to stop the Japanese reinforcements, and were then joined by the elite Shejing infantry. The two sides took turns shooting at each other. After a while, the Japanese decided that their casualties were just plain unacceptable and retreated. Watching their reinforcements being forced to retreat once again was incredibly demoralizing for the Japanese defenders, and they were starting to think about entering into negotiations with the Ming. Kato Kiyomasa's retainer, Minabo Kihachiro, put out a letter inside the fortress. In it, the letter tried to say that Kiyomasa was still at Sosengpo and that official should travel with him there so that they could discuss peace. It was, of course, a lie. Yang Hao offered that if Kato Kiyomasa would surrender, he would be rewarded. Neither side was going to compromise, though. After this, Yang Hao held a meeting with his commanders to discuss what their next course of action should be. He then ordered Joseon soldiers that weren't currently fighting to go out and forage for food for the Ming soldiers. At Hat Song Sun, Ma Gui and himself would oversee construction of thatched roof shelters so that the men could finally have some shelter from the elements. The Korean army then did a probing attack against the Sanomaru of the Tosan fortress. Kato Yoseyaman, who was in charge of its defense, had his men put up bundles of bamboo and from behind them commanded his matchlock men to fire in rank. The Joseon troops were forced to retreat, but actually had managed to pile up firewood at the base. They hoped that once the rain had let up, that they would actually be able to set fire to this section. Yang Hao would once again attempt to negotiate with the Japanese. But once again, the talks just didn't lead to anything. Then, later in the night, Kato Yoseimon and Kondo Goemon would attempt to raid the Ming camp. This failed, though, because once again, the camp was heavily guarded. They did manage, however, to burn a good bit of their firewood, though, to get rid of it. On February 3rd, the rain finally started to die down. Japanese sources say that in the early hours, the Ming deployed heavy cannons at Haksong San to destroy the walls. In reality, these were probably much smaller anti-personal cannons, but, you know, they're still deadly. Several Japanese soldiers were said to have run for cover at such a barrage. They would then be stopped by none other than Kato Kiyomasa himself. It's said that this barrage didn't remotely phase him, even though some of the cannon shots landed near him and even managed to hit one of his personal bodyguards, leaving behind only his legs. This lack of reaction made the Ming artillerymen change their trajectory, which caused them to mix their next round of shots. They would continue missing from there. The Japanese responded by firing back using their ozutsu. According to Ming sources, they came close to hitting Yang Hao, but he was equally unfazed. Now it should be noted that there's actually a big possibility that neither of these or just one of the events happened and that it was just propaganda. Just keep that in mind. In a similar assault, the same as the day before, the Joseon tried once again to attack Dosan. Once again, though, they were repelled with a barrage of lead. Then, at around 11 a.m., another flotilla appeared. These were different, though, as the banners that these ships flew weren't Kato Kiyomasa's, but instead were of Yamaguchi, Muninaga, and Mori Katsunobu. New reinforcements were on the way. They communicated to the defenders using flags and then left to report back to Sosengpo. Just seeing that new help was on the way lifted the spirits of the defenders. At around 6 p.m., forces under the commands of Kuroda Nagamasa, Takanaka Shigetoshi, and Anokochi Eiki arrived at Sosengpo and prepared to relieve the defenders. By nightfall, the heavy rains had stopped only to be replaced by strong icy winds. These conditions hurt the Ming soldiers, especially the ones stationed near the river. 
Once midnight had hit, 100 mounted samurai and hundreds of matchlock men leapt out of the eastern gate of the Ninomaru. They shot fire arrows and released volleys of matchlock fire against the Ming camp on the east side of Dasan before quickly turning back before the Ming could respond. It's now day seven. There was a strong cold wind blowing. At dawn, Yang Hao ordered his men to gather even more wood for another assault on Dasan. His thought was that this wind could be used to their advantage. The wind could feed the fires. And then they could finally burn down the last bit of resistance. By noon, a 26-strong Japanese flotilla from Yonpo was approaching Dosan. And just like before, the Ming on the banks of the river began firing cannons at them, to which the Japanese on the ships returned fire with their matchlocks. While the Ming were busy, a samurai and a few Ashiguru ran out from Dosan to the banks of the river and shouted at the Japanese ships. What he shouted, I'm not sure. But this did concern Yang Hao, who then sent back the right army to back up the Zhejiang elite troops at the river. Around 5 p.m., the Japanese ships decided to give up and left. At Soseng Po, Mori Hidemoto had finally arrived around the same time that all this was happening. He and the rest of the Japanese commanders there decided to hold a meeting about what to do. They decided that the next day they would send an advance force, but a majority of them would still stay there to wait for even more reinforcements. At around 6, Yang Hao gave out the order to ready the troops to attack. The Ming troops marched as quietly as they could while the sun was just under the horizon to hide them. They carried firewood under one arm while holding their shields in the other hand. Now, unfortunately for them, as they neared the outer defenses, the Japanese sentries spotted them, and then waves of matchlock fire hit them. When their casualties just became too heavy for the men to bear, the Ming retreated. At dusk, both the Ming and Joseon launched another attack, this one more fierce, if not reckless, than before. This time they ignored their own casualties and continued to charge forward under the continuous matchlock fire. The Japanese defenders started to be concerned that their matchlocks might not be enough to stop the Allied charge. So they used their ozutsu to fire on any large groups of soldiers advancing. The Ming finally called off their assault around 9 to 10 p.m. Yang Hao, after seeing another assault fail, decided that they just weren't going to take Dosan by force. They would now change their strategy. To achieve victory, they wouldn't need to use force, but instead lay siege to the fortress. When the Japanese had finally run out of supplies and were done with being starved, they would then be more willing to accept terms of surrender. He sent out the command that they should add a thatch roof to their tents to make something a little bit more permanent. He then told Korean Commander-in-Chief Guan Yu that they would need to hurry with their next delivery of supplies. Ma Guoi suggested at this time that they lifted the blockade on one side of the fortress that they could ambush the Japanese as they came out. Yang Hao dismissed this idea. He didn't think it would work. Late at night, a small Japanese ship approached Asan, slowly to not attract attention from the Ming. Around 30 Japanese came out and attempted to board the ship. They wouldn't get to, though, as they were attacked by several Ming Zhejiang troops waiting to ambush them. Seven of the Japanese were killed, while the rest of them managed to run back into the safety of Dosan. It's now the eighth day of the siege, and the Japanese are in the worst spot that they had ever been in. The last of the horses that they had 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 now been slaughtered and eaten. They were now eating mud off the walls, digging for roots in the ground, and picking through the cooking fires for burnt pieces of rice that might have spilled out from the cooking pots. It was even worse if you weren't one of the matchlock men, as they had had the priority for whatever food could be found, which makes sense, as they were doing all of the defending. If you weren't a part of the fire teams, you were pretty much on your own. 
And then there was the cold to consider. At this point, all semblance of pride was thrown away for warmth. At this time, it was common sight to see Ashiguru, the laborers, and even the samurai all huddled together for warmth. Most of the fuel for fires had already been burned up. And on the other side, things actually weren't much better. The Koreans didn't seem at this time to be managing the supply lines well. And there's definitely evidence of just blatant mismanagement. But there's also a big possibility that, well, they simply didn't have the means to supply the Ming armies either. Many of the reliable supplies that could be gotten was given to the Ming higher-ups, such as Yang Hao and Ma Guoi. Their war horses were also dying off by the hundreds. The animals had not been able to eat in nine days. Now this was a major blow to the Ming army, which was predominantly a cavalry-based army. At least, the one in Korea was. Anyways, by 7 a.m., the advance party had made their way from Sosengpo to Ulsan by foot, and then set up a camp on a hill named Songsan, which was about 12 kilometers away from Dusan. While they were setting up their camp, another group of Japanese ships was off the waters of Ulsan. They didn't try to break through, though. Instead, they just waded off in the water. Later on, Commander Kato Kiyomasa sent a letter to the Ming camp letting him know that he was open to negotiating a surrender. In the letter, it asked for permission to bring in a Buddhist monk that was aboard the Japanese ships in the water who would then act as a translator, as none of the defenders spoke Chinese. Yang Hao knew that he couldn't take Dosan by force, so he accepted, and the monk entered into the fortress. Letters were then sent back and forth between the Ming camp and Dosan, and in the end it was agreed that they would meet in three days, and that Kato Kiyomasa was required to attend it. What Yang Hao didn't know was that the ships in the water were already communicating via flag signals to the defenders in the fortress. And when the monk entered into the fortress, he brought news of the Japanese relief force, which greatly raised the morale of the defenders. The Japanese ships then turned around and returned to Sosengpo. Around noon, even more reinforcements under the commands of Nabashima Naoshige, his son, Nabashima Katsuhige, Hachisuka Iyamasa, Karayoshiaki, Ikoma Kazumasa, Wakizaka Yasuharo, and Hayakawa Nagamasa had arrived at Sosengpo. Late at night, Kato Kiyomasa sent out a foraging party. There's an excerpt from Yu Song Yang's book of corrections about this. Since they had no water in their mountain fortress, the enemy soldiers had to come out every night to get water. Military Commissioner Yang Hao ordered Commander Kim Ung So to attack them. Kim led his men and lay in ambush until the Japanese showed up at the well outside of the Japanese walls. He captured a hundred soldiers one night. The captors who were brought looked so thin and ill-nourished. The generals in our camp said, Since their provisions have nearly run out, they will not last long. If we continue to lay siege to the enemy, they will collapse on their own. Day 9, Yu Song Yong, chief state counselor and writer of the book that I just quoted, went to Ulsan at dawn to give a greeting to both Yang Hao and Ma Guoi. After all, it was the Chinese New Year. A stressed Yang Hao responded by urging him instead to go back to Kyongju as soon as he could so that more supplies could be delivered. Things were rather dire for the Ming. It was just as bad, if not worse though, for the Japanese. Starvation was killing them off, and it's true, they could not hold on forever. Both Kato Kiyomasa and his lieutenant Asano Yoshinaga wrote a letter to the seven commanders explaining the situation in Dosan. In it, they said that if reinforcements did not arrive soon, that they would simply fight to the last man, and if the fortress fell, that news of their sacrifice should be brought to Japan. Later on in the day, Ming scouts saw evidence of Japanese movement at Song San and raced back to let their superiors know. Yang Hao decided that since the Japanese advance party wasn't very big, 
that only Zhu Chengzun and his men would be needed to reinforce Wu Weizong's men on the other side of the Taewa River. They would then keep their distance and monitor the Japanese. While this happened, Shimizu Toyehisa arrived at Yanyang and then captured the nearby fortress, killing the garrison there protecting it. Around two, even more reinforcements started to arrive at So Seng Po, followed by another group just two hours later. In the evening, two of Asano Yoshinaga's retainers and a retainer of Oda Kazuyoshi snuck out of Dosan under the cover of darkness and managed to deliver the letter that Kato Kiyomasa and his lieutenant wrote and then delivered it to the commanders at So Seng Po. After receiving the letter, the commanders held an emergency meeting and then made the decision that they could wait no longer. Mori Hidemoto started a joint letter on the spot, which all of the commanders signed. It was about the state of Dosan, and it was to be sent to Taiko Hiyoshi. On day 10 of the siege, the Japanese finally made their move to relieve the defenders. They would do so both by land and sea. Nabushima Naoshige and Kuroda Nagamasa left first, going the route on land that they had decided on in the joint meeting. Second to leave would be Kato Yoshiaki, Akoma Kazumasa, Nakagawa Hidenari, Wakazaka Yasuharu, Yamaguchi Muninaga, and Akita Hideo. Mori Hidemoto would be the last to depart on land with his men. By sea would be Chosokabe Motochika and Akita Hidoiji. But first, they would sail to Yampo to combine their fleet with Kato Kiyomasa's. All of Kiyomasa's remaining soldiers would use their comrade ships to ferry them to the battle ahead. Now crazy enough, this wouldn't be all that was headed towards Dosan. Shimizu Toyehisa had already arrived at Eonyang the previous day and would be continuing onwards. Mori Takamasa and Kikawa Hiroi were also en route. But even that's not all. Toto Takatora had recently completed the Sunchan Fortress and sent his adopted son, Toto Takeyoshi and Toto Yoshikatsu, and Matsura Shigenobu, who had also helped in the construction of the fortress at Sachan, was on the way. But even that wasn't all. Kurishima Hikezoyiman and what was left of Michifusa's fleet from the Bao of Mianyang was sailing towards that direction, and Khan Ueman Pache, son of Michinaga, was also bringing part of his far's fleet to help the defenders. As the relief force started to pour into Songsan, the small camp there was now alive with hundreds, if not thousands, of banners of different colors and sizes. Yang Hao's scouts reported this very thing to him, which greatly unnerved him. He then ordered a contingent of cavalrymen to reinforce the men at the northern bank of Jotun to set up a second line of defense, should it be needed. He also sent Mao Guoqi and his southern Ming troops to reinforce Wu Weizong's elite troops to guard the riverbanks around Dosan Fortress. This quick response would be a very different one to the careless response of Lu Zhizong, who was supposed to be watching the river mouth several kilometers away from Tosan. For whatever reason, he didn't seem to notice the massive amount of Japanese ships gathering at Yanpo. This, of course, would be a very costly mistake for the Ming. Later in the night, funny enough, Kato Kiyomasa, seemingly oblivious to the massive amount of support that he would soon get, sent another message to Song San for help. His plea, of course, would soon be answered. It's now day 11 of the siege, and it's also the day when the negotiations for surrender are supposed to take place. Yang Hao sent a messenger to the edge of the fortress before the sun had even risen to get Kato Kiyomasa to come out so that the negotiations could begin. It seems that, according to Chinese sources, that this was all a ploy to capture the commander, and that they were never actually going to go forward with the peace talks. Not that it mattered, though, because Kato Kiyomasa wasn't going to show up. The negotiations for him was simply a tactic for time. As said previously, if his comrades couldn't come and save him and what was left of his men, he had decided to die fighting. Now sometime around after this, the Japanese ships at Yampo started on their way towards Dusan. While this was happening, Joseon naval commander 
Yun Yong, who had been at Gyeongju, decided to make his way there and was scouting at the river for more information. The sight that he saw alarmed him greatly. Japanese warships pouring into the Namgang River. He then sent a report to Yu Song Yong and moved his ships far away from that area. However, no report was sent to the Ming. By 4 p.m., the fleet at Ulsan was blockading both the Taewa River and Dungcheon River. As this was happening, the last part of the Japanese relief force had now arrived at Ulsan. The first two groups then set up a new camp on a hill south of Jotun. This cut off Zhu Chengzun and Wu Weizong's detachment from the rest of the Ming army. They were also now being attacked in skirmishes from the Japanese. These groups were organized into parties of around 50 soldiers in each. Upon seeing that the Ming in the area couldn't move, Kuroda Nagamasa, Nabashima Naoshige, Hachisuka Iemasa, and both Mori Takamasa and Kikawa Hiroi marched their men towards Dasan. With the massive Japanese ships on the river providing support, they then decided to move their armies across the Tewa River. The Ming, however, wouldn't let them. Both Li Rumei and Ji Sheng led a large contingent of cavalry along with Joseon troops to the bank to stop them. And after an incredibly brutal battle, the Japanese were forced into the southern bank of the Tewa. The battle was a mess about now. The Japanese ships filled the river. The entire south bank of the Tewa was alive with Japanese men and their banners were all over the place. At this time, Yang Hao could either retreat or take the time that his men at the river was providing him to attack one last time, break through Kato Kiyomasa's defenses, and capture the commander. Yang Hao wasn't interested in retreating though, so he gave orders for torches to be prepared for a night attack. He would, according to Chinese sources, reorganize the Ming forces into three defensive positions. Po Guai and Bai Sei would remain at Jotun, and two Joseon commanders and their men would be sent there as well so that they could keep the Japanese under watch. Li Rumei and Ji Sheng and a couple of Joseon detachments would defend the riverbank against any Japanese landings, and the southern Ming troops under Wu Weizong and Ma Guoqi would be positioned at the junction of the river to guard both the southern bank and the Japanese ships at the Dongchon River. Wu Weizong's detachment and Zhu Chengzun's on the southern bank of the Jotun were basically abandoned. Lu Zhizong and his men were actually in a worse spot out of all of these though. As they were stuck between the Japanese-held naval base at Yanpo, the fleet on the water, and the relief armies, he also didn't really have a way to communicate with the main army. While the Ming were busy preparing for their final assault, the Japanese were also preparing. Mori Hitamoto sent two messengers to sneak into Tosan Fortress to let Kato Kiyomasa know that help would soon arrive. So just keep holding out. While these messages were being traded back and forth, Shimizu Toyohisa, as night fell, moved his men from Ionyang and were now marching his men to Ulsan as well. I now want to take a minute to explain the condition of the Japanese defenders inside Tosan. From the beginning, Kato Kiyomasa had determined that the matchlock men were the most important in terms of the defense of Dusan. And because of this, while most of the men sat starving and in a daze from dehydration, the gunners at the wall weren't. You see, Kiyomasa had made sure that the gunners got priority as far as supplies were concerned, which meant that there was still some fight left in them, as you'll see. Day 12. It's just past midnight and the Ming were readying their final assault. Yang Hao gave the order to attack, and all the Ming's artillery was fired at Tusan, setting anything that could be on fire ablaze. The Ming soldiers then rushed forward to scale the walls with their ladders. There was a problem, though. The Japanese had just heard that they would soon be reinforced and were able to fight back with all of their strength. Salvation was on the way, and morale was with them. The same could not be said for the Ming. The conditions had already taken their toll on the men. And on top of that, while the first day had been extremely successful, 
every day since then had been disappointing. If morale was with the Japanese, it wasn't with the Ming. Yang Hao would have to have several men executed for desertion, and even had a cavalry commander tied up in front of the men because he was starting to give up himself. Another thing worth mentioning was that the bravery of the Ming captains was also starting to work against them. Because of their bravery, they typically led their men from the front. And because of this, they typically died in front of their men too. While this was happening, a letter was intercepted by the Ming. This letter was then immediately brought before Yang Hao and Ma Guoi. This letter was quite alarming for the Ming commanders. In it, it said that numerous commanders and around 60,000 men had come to save the defenders. Yang Hao was also receiving reports at the same time that 90 Japanese ships were sailing up the Taewa River, and they would soon be at risk of being surrounded. Yang Hao would have a short meeting with Ma Guoi before giving the command at 7 a.m. that they now needed to retreat. There's actually some discrepancy between Chinese and Korean sources about what happened next. Now, Chinese sources insinuate that they told the Joseon that they would soon be retreating, while Korean sources such as the Sanjo Silik say that they were not told about the retreat and only caught on when they saw the Ming burning supplies and taking down their shelters. Either way, the Joseon commanders and even some officials beseeched the Ming to stay and fight. They felt that victory could still be obtained. The Ming felt differently and thought that all the plans that the Joseon were suggesting was not only pointless but foolish. Now given the circumstances, the Ming's mindset was, well, understandable. Yu Song Yang also wrote about this. Later, the Japanese sent their relief force by land, and as they approached, Yang Hao became scared, and then all of a sudden withdrew his army. I think it's obvious that there was now tensions with the Allies. Either way, by 9 a.m., the Ming were in full retreat. The infantry and wounded were to be the first to leave. The order was to make their way across the Dongchun River and then continue onwards to Kyongju. While any of the troops currently surrounding Dosan would retreat towards the mountains, the cavalry commanders and their men at Jotun, as well as Li Rumei and Zhi Sheng on the west riverbank, were to guard the Ming army as they retreated. By 3 p.m., other than the forces ordered to guard the rear and Yang Hao, the Ming army had successfully retreated in orderly fashion. With that out of the way, Yang Hao at Hak Song San then ordered his troops to take their own camps down and prepare to leave. This included the burning of supplies and the destruction of weapons, armor, and really anything that would have to be left behind. While this was happening, a Korean shipment of supplies also showed up. This too was burned. Yang Hao and his men then started to leave. Inside Dosan, the Ming retreat hadn't gone unnoticed without delay. Kato Kiyomasa sent a messenger out to the relief army across the Taewa River. There were still some concerns on the Japanese side, so they opted to keep scouting the area and wait for a better opening. When smoke from the burning of supplies could be seen, well, then they decided to act. However, there was still a problem. Both Kuroda Nagamasa and Hachisuka Iyamasa were hesitating still, which delayed the joint army from moving and possibly from taking a big opportunity. This act would later be reported to Toyotomi Hideyoshi himself, who would punish both of them. While this hesitation of the first army was going on, the second and third armies came under attack from Wu Wei Zong's elite troops and Zhu Cheng Zun's. Mori Hidemoto's troops and these elite Ming troops were actually pretty evenly matched, though, so there really wasn't any progress made for either side. Although, you could say that the fact that the second and third armies were currently engaged was technically a victory for the Ming. Kikawa Hiroi, who was behind both Hachisuka Iyamasa and Kuroda Nagamasa, had lost his patience with the both of them at this time, and commanded his men to make their way across the river. 
Anakokuchi Ieki would confront him, calling him impatient and disobedient. Hiroi would then snap back that monks should not interfere with the business of samurai. He then crossed the river. Now, unfortunately, his brave actions would purposely not be reported to Hideyoshi by his superiors. The first army was now crossing the river so that they could attack the Ming's rear. While this happened, the Japanese fleet on the Dungchang River was starting to land troops, and the Japanese inside Dosan were also running out of their gates to fire upon the Ming as they retreated. The Ming realized that if they didn't act fast enough, that they would soon be surrounded, and in these circumstances, doomed. So they went on the attack and launched themselves at the Japanese force crossing the river, who were also now rushing forward to attack themselves. The attack was very brief with few casualties. The mounted Ming soldiers were now in retreat. The Japanese army then took control of the Tewa River's north bank. Hikawa Hiroi, however, wasn't pleased with this progress though, as he felt that they were still being too slow. So he raced forward and recaptured Byongyongsong, which in turn cut Yang Hao off from being able to retreat to Kyongju. Yang Hao was now forced west towards Yongyang. Seeing this, 300 troops disembarking from the Japanese ships raced forward to recklessly attack the Ming rearguard, who was able to chase them away through a charge. Funny enough though, Shimizu Toyohisa had just arrived to Ulsan from Yangyang. He then joined forces with the men getting off the ships and blocked the roads to cut off Yang Hao's retreat once again. This forced Yang Hao to take a mountain route to Kyongju. Toyohisa responded by urging his horse forward, but did so alone as his men were on foot. Still, he did manage to cut down two Ming soldiers before turning his horse back around. Now, if we go south, to the battle happening between Wu Weizong, Zhu Changzun, and the Japanese second and third armies, well, the Japanese were now gaining ground. Wu Weizong's men called a retreat and forced their way north across the river, but came under fire from the Japanese ships and suffered greatly for it. Zhu Changzun went a different route. As they still had horses, they would actually force their way out from the Japanese encirclement south. Now, according to Chinese sources, he was still upset at the situation, so he had some troops sneak into Sosengpo Fortress that at this point was mostly empty to steal a signboard and left for Alloyed territory. Tosan Fortress was now completely secured, and supplies were being given to the defenders. This would later cause problems as many of the men overate and overdrank, which caused many of them to become sick and some even died from this. Kuroda Nagamasa was now feeling confident enough to start killing off any Ming stragglers and pursued any Ming forces left in the area. To his credit, his men did kill a good number of these stragglers and did catch up to the retreating Ming army behind the hill of Baigamsa Temple. The Ming rearguard was ordered once again to cover the retreat. Now, according to Ming sources, Li Rumei and Xi Sheng would then lead a cavalry charge against the Japanese, leading to several casualties. The Japanese then backed off as the Ming cavalry rejoined the main force. They didn't give up, however. Instead, they continued their pursuit from a safer distance. These sources go on to say that the two sides stood their ground and stared off against each other, and it was then broken when two mounted samurai rode forward to test the Ming, who in turn cut their heads off. The Japanese then gave up and returned to Ulsan. This is actually a stark contrast when using Japanese and Korean sources. Sources such as the Sanjo Silik say that the Japanese charged the retreating Allied troops and killed large amounts of stragglers. Far away from this battle, Lu Zhizong would also escape. Korean sources typically say that he and his men were all wiped out due to the fact that he lost contact with the main forces. But he wasn't. He did lose 700 of his original 2100 man force, though according to Ming sources. As for Yang Hao, he went to Kyongju briefly and then went to Andong.
and the Japanese relief force would then settle down at the walled city at Ulsan. The commanders would then write their accounts of what had happened and then send it back to Hideyoshi in Japan. Before you go, stay a while and let's discuss the casualties of this siege. Though I will ask you to come into this with an open mind, as I know that this is not only a touchy subject, but many come into it with a bias, and this applies to me as well, though I will leave my level of bias up to you, the viewer. There is of course three different combatants that took a part of this battle. The Ming, Joseon, and Nippon, or Chinese, Korean, and Japanese. With that comes three points of view of the siege. One of the things that I tried to do as a historical content creator is to look at these different sources and try and determine who is more reliable. And if more than one side agrees and says similar things, they tend to be more trustworthy in that regard. The next thing that I have to do is determine if a source is heavily romanticized and or being viewed through a nationalistic lens. Unfortunately, that last part has to be paid a lot of attention to, as modern historians fall victim to this. And the political nature of the modern world plays an impact on how a lot of historians put out information. For some, and I hate to use this language, it becomes their truth. And take a moment to think about it and do with it what you will. Now, I will make my position. I do not believe Ming death figures are as low as some sources claim. Throughout this siege, I have predominantly used Chinese sources, then Korean, and lastly Japanese. The reason I have put Japanese sources last is that these sources tend to have a literal ton of exaggeration. They're meant to make the writers sound like they have suffered unbelievable odds, which, to be fair, they did, and fought an enemy whose numbers never ended. They come across as, men died all around me. Yet I persisted. I cut down hundreds of soldiers alone, blah, 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 blah. One source actually describes the Ming armies as having 800,000 men, and that the Japanese killed 16,000 Ming troops as they retreated. He also says that 19,000 Japanese were killed in the first day of the siege. This source is often cited as being accurate as far as Japanese casualties which is just obviously not the case. I mean, many of the sources can't even agree with how many Japanese defenders were even there. Some say 10,000, others just a touch above 20,000. Sources like this should not be taken with not only just a grain of salt, but with the whole container. Now, other Japanese sources, such as the writings of Kenan, who was a monk, are a little bit more reliable as he wasn't a warrior and not there for personal glory. But that doesn't really address why I think Ming death figures are almost certainly much higher than is being put out there. Some say that the deaths are as low as 800. My biggest reason that I say this is how the Ming described the siege as well as the Koreans. Numerous charges against the wall were done, every time ending in failure and being described as costly for the Allied forces. Korean sources such as the Jingbrook describe them as ending in mountains of dead. Now numerically, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the Allied side to have such low casualties, but also call off numerous assaults numerous times because they're just too costly. Now, even if we double this figure, be next to nothing considering the Allied army starts off the siege with around 46,000 troops, according to Ming sources. We're talking about men charging walls with handheld shields out in the open against waves of matchlock bullets. The armor that the Allied side wore had no ability to stop said matchlock bullets. There's also the fact 
that there were several shootouts between the Ming on the riverbanks versus the Japanese in their ships. And while the Ming did have cannons, and yes, these cannons did cause severe casualties on the Japanese side, the Japanese matchlock fire from both standard Teppo and Ozutsu would have come in waves against those on the riverbanks. It would be absolutely incredible to not have a good amount of casualties from these engagements. The last part that's substantial enough to talk about is the last day of fighting. In all truth, I do feel that the details of the retreat are iffy on all sides. The Ming put out that the retreat was orderly and that there was next to no casualties. The Japanese sources basically say that they annihilated the Ming as they retreated. The Koreans basically say the same thing, but this could also be because there was tensions between the two sides at this time. Remember, Korean sources do say that the Ming didn't alert them of the retreat. And whatever you believe, this could be a source of anger. The truth is something probably in between all of these sources, as all three sides actually have a reason to alter the truth to fit their narrative. I actually believe that the Ming would have a mostly orderly retreat. The Ming, after all, were an incredibly professional army. However, a lot of these men would be weak from several days without adequate nutrition. And they were operating in incredibly harsh conditions. Their ability to fight back would be severely impaired. This includes their war horses, who, according to Chinese sources, hadn't really eaten due to a lack of supplies. Also, the Japanese would have still had their matchlocks, which, as I've said before, the armor worn by the Allied army wouldn't have protected them from. Then, when these armies are grouped together, these weapons would have devastating effects. That's not to mention how long the reach of these weapons were. It's really hard to imagine that the Japanese would not have harassed the Ming army with these weapons as the Ming retreated, especially since that's basically been their main tactic since the start of the invasion. But these are my thoughts and also where I will leave you. I'll see you next time.